Hello, good morning, everybody. We're going to start now. Um, I wish, wait a second. So good, good morning to everybody, uh, to all of those accompanying us in the North, Central, South America. Good afternoon and good evening to those accompanying us in different locations in Europe. North America, North Africa and the Pacific. Uh, we've received a lot of inscriptions and we hope that you all start joining us. Uh, we're also transmitting live through the Facebook Live of the Museum, University Museum, Museo de la Universidad del Rosario and the Vice Presidency of the International Affairs. My name is Ingrid Frederick and I am representing the University, Universidad del Rosario. We are located in the historic center of the city of Bogota, capital of Colombia, in the same location since the year 1653. This means that at the end of this year, we are reaching our 367th birthday. We have a cultural and historical heritage department since 2011 and head of Luis Enrique Nieto and the University Museum was officially created in 2017 by lead of Margarita Guzman. The purpose of the museum is taking care of, researching and disseminating this vast cultural heritage, both tangible, expressed in buildings and collections, as well as its intangible heritage. This year is also our 45th anniversary of the National Heritage Listing of the Old Cloister Buildings, known as Claustro Mayor del Rosario in honor of Our Lady of Rosary. It, it was listed as a national monument in 1975 and during this whole month we have had special events in the context of the heritage celebration in the month of September, a celebration that started to take place in Colombia since 1998. <clears throat> now, I wish to welcome our main speaker, Dr. Ege Wilderim, in charge of the lecture, Golden Treasures and Golden Opportunities, Relating Cultural Heritage to Sustainable Development. Dr. Wilderim is accompanying us from Istanbul, Turkey, and it is uh, our pleasure to have you here. I will give you the word in brief, but first we will have a couple of introduction words from our guest, Maria Eugenia Beltran representing ICMOS Colombia. I wish to give her a warm welcome. She is joining from the city of Armenia in the coffee cultural landscape of Colombia, a World Heritage Site inscribed in 2011. And she also participated in this nomination process. She is an architect and urban, planning, urban planner from the um, Catholic University of Chile and the Universidad Piloto in Bogota, Colombia. I would like to remind all participants joining us that you can send me your questions through the chat option. Just make sure to send it to my, um, to Ingrid Frederick and we will collect all the questions for the end of the lecture. Um, so now I give the word to Maria Eugenia. Eh, buenos días para todos. Eh, gracias por la presentación y por la invitación. Eh, maravilloso volver al, a la Universidad del Rosario. Eh, y a Margarita, quien ha sido una coequipera en temas de museología para Colombia. Eh, mm, en nombre de ICOMOS Colombia, y bueno, me estoy estrenando eh, porque apenas me vinculé hace un año a ICOMOS Colombia y de alguna manera eh, conociendo a la doctora Eich. Le doy la bienvenida eh, en, el, en la presentación que hemos eh, convenido eh, para que mm, todos conozcamos un poco del tema. Eh, Colombia tiene una, eh, un, un reconocimiento mundial a través de UNESCO del paisaje cultural cafetero. El tema eh, es, eh, además ha tenido un reconocimiento reciente como... Eh, buenas prácticas o, o digámoslo en términos de, de sostenibilidad, desarrollo sostenible. Eh, desde el 2011 fue reconocido el paisaje cultural cafetero como, como patrimonio de la humanidad. 
el tema eh, como patrimonio cultural eh, sostenible, porque Colombia, eh, en el corazón de Colombia, hay un territorio que lleva más de 50 años produciendo riqueza al país. Colombia es conocido por el café y eh, detrás de la producción de café hay un trabajo fuerte de campesinos, de pequeñas parcelas que ya llevan cuatro generaciones produciendo y generando su propia cultura, eh, en, en algún momento acompañadas por la Federación Nacional de Cafeteros en el logro de mantener un precio estable que les generara una condición estable eh, económicamente a las familias productoras y un magnífico aprovechamiento de las montañas en los Andes del Quindío. Sin embargo, el reconocimiento de UNESCO es un llamado de alerta eh, por la pérdida de valores patrimoniales de la región, eh, en principio motivados por el no pacto mundial del café, lo que dejó a los, pro, a los productores, tanto los exportadores como a los pequeños productores, en una inseguridad económica, eh, adicionando a ello eh, la amenaza del mercado, cambio de, de uso de suelos y eh, el tema comercial que eh, los pequeños productores no, no manejan. Eh, esto ha venido en un deterioro por el cambio de actividad, se ha perdido eh, hectáreas de producción de café, lo cual genera también una sospechosa insostenibilidad económica y cultural de la región. Los nuevos jóvenes hoy no se consideran eh, cafeteros. Y eh, para acabar eh, de completar el escenario, en el 1999, 25 de enero, la región fue golpeada por un sismo de gran magnitud que generó grandes pérdidas eh, físicas, deslizamientos de tierra, eh, muertes y eh, una migración del campo a las, a las poblaciones que inicialmente pensamos o se pensó que eran temporales, pero que con el paso del tiempo, ya llevamos 20 años, eh, no, no volvieron al campo y entonces se generaron algunos eh, cordones de, de pobreza. Sin embargo, los cafeteros buscaron como alternativa el turismo rural. El turismo rural eh, permitió que las fincas cafeteras se convirtieran en un eh, destino para avistamiento de aves, para repensar económicamente la región, eh, pero también el turismo de alguna manera es una amenaza porque se convierte en una mm, alternativa económica, pero en un... Eh, en un daño eh, de alto impacto, eh, aun cuando hay avistamiento de aves, hay cabalgatas, hay paseos en los jeeps, hay balsaje, eh, el alto impacto que genera eh, los carros eh, y, el, eh, y el exceso de, de visitantes en los hoteles eh, nos pone en alerta. Eh, este es el escenario, el paisaje cultural cafetero eh, cobija cuatro departamentos, Caldas, Quindío, Rizaralda y el norte del Valle, eh, todos territorios que producen café, eh, café que tiene unas ciertas condiciones, está producido en eh, Piedemonte, de Mon Piedemonte de la Cordillera Central y no es un paisaje continuo, es un paisaje eh, discontinuo, tiene algunos centros históricos y bueno, eh, con este escenario le damos la bienvenida a la doctora eh, Gildre, eh, para que nos converse sobre lo que ICOMOS y el mundo entero está pensando eh, ahora en la celebración de, de la de las mes de patrimonio que hoy, hoy, se, hoy es septiembre 30, estamos prácticamente cerrando el mes del patrimonio a nivel mundial y a nivel Colombia. Muchas gracias Ingrid, muchas gracias Margarita y bienvenida doctora Gildre. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Maria Eugenia, for your introduction. We will now continue with the presentation of Dr. Ege Wilderim. Dr. Ege Wilderim is an urban planner specializing in heritage conservation and management with over 20 years of experience working in Turkey and internationally. She previously worked at KABA Architecture Ankara with the Abu Dhabi Authority for Culture and Heritage. She obtained her MA in conservation at the University of York in 1999 and her PhD in social environmental sciences at Ankara University in 2012. She was a Fulbright scholar 
at Pratt Universe, uh, Institute, New York City, 2006, 2007, and a senior fellow for our, the archeological site management at Koch University, Istanbul. She is currently the ICMOS Focal Point for Sustainable Development Goals, member of the ISO um, CARP and board member of ICMOS Turkey and Euro, uh, Europa Nostra Turkey. Based in Istanbul since, two, since 2013, she is independent consultant and part-time instructor and since 2015, heritage site manager of the historic guild town of Mudurno, Turkey, a World Heritage, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage uh, candidate. I will now give the word to Dr. Ege Wildram. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. Muchas gracias. It's wonderful to be here. Um, greetings from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, as the sun is setting soon, <laughs> yours will be rising higher. Um, but thank, thanks to Zoom to connect us all today. Um, uh, indeed, thank you very much to um, Ingrid and your team and uh, to Maria, uh, my colleague from ICOMOS as well, and the Univers Universidad de Rosario, sorry for my pronunciation. Speaking of pronunciation, I uh, regret to, uh, the, the fact that I can't really speak Spanish, but I did present and um, prepare my um, presentation today bilingually, thanks to Google Translate and Ingrid's help. Uh, so uh, hopefully the language which issues um, will not be a problem. Um, now I will share my screen for you. And also before beginning, I'd like to um, um, salute the Colombian coffee cultural landscapes. Um, Maria just shared that it was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2011. Um, actually, I was there in that meeting. I remember the inscription and I was quite happy and interested to see a cultural landscape of coffee. And cof actually landscapes are a very important medium where we see heritage and sustainable development issues collide. And uh, Maria shared a great story about that already. Um, I will also try to share some uh, local experiences from Turkey at the end, if time allows. Um, I will try to uh, manage my time wisely. Um, so uh, today's topic, um, we, we titled it um, in this um, interesting, ambitious uh, way, um, a little crazy, why golden treasures? Uh, maybe it's because my um, experience, my image of Colombia, <laughs> like many other people, it's a cliche maybe or a stereotype, but gold comes to mind. But I have a special story for it as well. It's not just a cliche for me. Um, the fact is that I had a wonderful day in Bogota in 2016. Um, I was on um, transit to um, the United Nations Habitat 3 Forum in Quito, Ecuador. Maybe you will know about that uh, big summit. Um, and I had enough time to, um, to spend in the day. And I met some wonderful Colombian ladies who took me to the Museo del Oro. And um, uh, it was an unforgettable experience, also uh, with many other things um, that um, presented the country to me. We already know about Bogota's very good transportation projects, um, as well as gastronomy, the local food, um, and the local hospitality. It was just a, a wonderful day. So heritage connects people across the world, indeed. In every day we can see this. Um, and uh, there's another reason uh, why I want to um, mentioned gold and treasures because maybe cultural heritage um, can be conceived of as a treasure. Um, and um, be before um, going into um, the other um, topics of ours today, um, I just like to make this statement and, and let us all keep in mind, you know, um, how cultural heritage can be positioned in, in um, the bigger life of societies. Um, and there is an important transition going on today in terms of what cultural heritage is meant to be. Um, there is a classical definition of it, which gives us um, clues, um, the tangible and intangible expression of the ways of living developed by a community and passed down from generation to generation. This can be customs, practices, places, objects, and expressions, values. And these connect the past with the present, with the future. And it gives us a sense of continuity and groundedness, especially in a time like this during COVID-19, the uncertainty, the stress, um, the unknown. In these times, actually, culture and cultural heritage, which embodies this, uh, em embodies culture in it, uh, was a great uh, source of comfort and uh, resilience, actually, for us. 
Um, and beyond this, there are more treasures, more values in cultural heritage for many different types of sectors and fields that may not necessarily uh, look related to cultural heritage. Actually, there are many relations of culture and heritage with um, sectors um, such as local economic growth, employment, this is through cultural tourism um, you, many times, cultural creative businesses. It's also um, what we value as human beings, our psychology, um, our dignity, our identity, how, how we uh, feel well, uh, what we know, the knowledge that, for example, during COVID, a lot of traditional knowledge is passed on about how to cope with these pandemics. And in general, it's uh, really a driver and enabler of sustainable development. This is the big idea that UNESCO and ECOMOS and many um, cultural heritage professionals have been advocating um, nowadays. Um, so let's keep this in mind um, as uh, we um, reflect on the topics today. Um, in terms of what I'll be talking about, um, just a few um, summary inf um, brief ideas, um, information points about the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, um, and then talk about ECOMOS with which I work closely, um, what we do about the SDGs, our activities, um, some specific um, updates on culture and COVID, um, our progresses and challenges and um, some local examples from Turkey where I'm from because localizing uh, sustainable development into um, grassroots level, the real life, the sites where things really happen. This is another challenge um, that we have to bear in mind. So um, on to the 2030 agenda. Um, I'm sure there's no one left who hasn't heard of this um, by now. I hope so anyway. Um, the um, UN 2030 agenda, it's a very high level United Nations uh, plan of action, but it's meant to be accessible to everybody. Everybody has a role to play. Um, and it's a plan of action for everything that we care about really under the sun people planet prosperity peace partnerships um, and organized around 17 thematic goals the sdgs and their sub targets the 169 targets um, these have um, certain um, indicators um, desired states to reach by 2030 and already we are one third of the way in uh, we five years have passed since their adoption in 2015 now we have 10 years left until 2030 and the decade of action has been de declared at the beginning of 2020 um, and what a year it has been i mean COVID has really welcomed us with all the crises of the world in an exacerbated way as a wake-up call uh, maybe this is a signal um, which is a big opportunity for us at the same time um, in terms of sustainability and the future of our planet and our lives and future generations. Um, a little bit more on the uh, 2030 agenda. Um, justice is actually at the core of it, you might say. Um, human rights are the basis of the SDGs theoretical framework. Um, nowadays, the, one of our most important keywords is inclusiveness especially leaving no one behind, especially the ones who are most vulnerable, most left behind. Um, we talked about the five pillars or spheres um, of uh, sustainability. Uh, we do want to see culture recognized as one of these pillars, actually. And there are um, campaigns going um, about this because culture is everywhere and it connects all the different dimensions of society. Um, sometimes we don't see it very clearly um, until we lose it. Um, it you know, it, it's something that is often um, understood when it's at risk of um, being lost, unfortunately. Um, also, we have some other associated thematic UN agendas uh, under the umbrella of the SDGs and the new urban agenda. We talked about Quito, the um, Habitat 3, um, the uh, climate change agenda, of course, the Paris Agreement, um, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Management, um, Finance for Development um, from the Addis Ababa agenda. Uh, so we try to follow these at ECOMOS as much as we can, but the new urban agenda is um, the closest one um, that we are engaged in. And um, a lot of plans are made in life, but uh, are they implemented? Um, so uh, implementation of the SDGs um, 
is a um, big topic that um, is debated and um, the tools are developed, the methodologies for this. We talked about how localizing is key from the most um, international to the um, most local and individual level and to monitor progress through the indicators and through annual reviews at the high level political forum where um, every nation is invited to um, submit their national reports. Local governments are now submitting their reports as well as different agencies on different topics. You can find all of this information in the um, website provided there. And uh, what about culture again, um, and cultural heritage in the UN agenda, 2030 agenda? Well, on one side, we are very lucky because we have one particular target, um, target 11.4 under SDG 11, the urban goal, which clearly states protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. A lot of work was done to get there, to have this target actually included in the final document. Um, but we find it is not enough. Um, there are other references, um, uh, less clear, um, less high level, uh, such as under education for a culture of peace, under um, economy and um, sustainable consumption and production, number 12, usually through tourism and local cultural products. Um, but actually, the more we work, the more we realize that all SDGs um, have something to say about culture. We need to say it. It, um, and uh, we're trying to uh, make sure that uh, in the future, uh, the, the UN agendas for sustainable development recognize this uh, more clearly, as we said, UNESCO and UN resolutions um, have actually uh, laid the groundwork, but um, there is still more to be done to make it a reality, to have it mainstreamed in real practices, real policies at all levels. Um, and where is ECOMOS in all this? Well. Um, I don't know about our audience, how familiar you are with ECOMOS, but let me just um, introduce um, the organization very quickly. Anyway, um, this is the International Council on Monuments and Sites, um, the global um, cultural heritage NGO. Um, we are, were founded in 1965. Uh, many people know ECOMOS well um, as an advisory body to the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. But you know, World Heritage is the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's only about 1,000 sites all over the world, whereas cultural heritage is so much more than that. And ECOMOS, through um, more than 100 national committees, more, um, all, uh, almost 30 international scientific committees, they work uh, to, with different partners to protect all kinds of heritage at local levels as well. I'm sure ECOMOS Colombia is also active um, with the World Heritage Sites. Um, Mario, Maria can uh, give us more information maybe later on that if there are questions. Um, I also work on the ECOMOS Turkey board myself. Um, so it's uh, actually a, a big privilege to be at a local national committee level and the international working group level. Um, and uh, through our uh, work at, uh, with the SDGs, um, we are reminding ourselves and colleagues that the 2030 agenda is an imperative to transform our work. So we are trying to transform our work to be more sustainably oriented, to contribute more to the progress well-being of society. Uh, we have some doctrine about this. We're mobilizing our networks. There's an enormous resource of experts all around the world. Many of us um, have so much more to contribute to uh, what happens with the decision making, with how um, cities are developed, how heritage is protected. <clears throat> A little bit more uh, technical information on our working group on the SDGs. Um, it, this is one of the six working groups of ECOMOS, um, in, uh, transversal across all committees. So we, we are trying to get representation from all countries, all uh, thematic committees. Um, I've been the focal point, the coordinator for four years now. This is my last year. We will have a new focal point soon. Um, our documents to work, uh, which we work with, um, are, well, very importantly, the Paris Declaration on Heritage as a Driver of development from 2011. Um, we've had different resolutions, a concept note developed, um, and we have an action plan that uh, we are trying to follow um, our actions by, um, cultural heritage and localizing the SDGs. You can find all of this online in the websites that I provide at the end, um, or it's very easy to go on ecomos.org and reach our sustainable development work there. Um, and uh, what does the action plan say? Uh, well, we've established some principles about how we should uh, move as heritage experts. 
we look for visibility in different platforms, what we contribute uniquely. Uh, we need to be consistent and inclusive and have uh, the right language to communicate effectively, um, uh, make a, a lot of partnerships, uh, in, in make sure there is enough uh, diversity, um, make sure there are culture nature connections and how cultural heritage fits in into the larger picture of culture. Our three action areas are organizing ourselves and, and partnerships, localizing, so providing guidance um, and support at um, different levels to different st stakeholders, and monitoring, um, supporting the development of indicators of progress. Um, and our vision is, main, um, as you see, just the mainstreaming of cultural heritage into sustainable development. But actually, we've discovered that this is um, a two-way advocacy. While we are trying to mainstream cultural heritage into sustainable development, telling development um, actors, look, cultural heritage is important for your work, please consider it. We are also going the other way, trying to mainstream sustainable development into heritage. Um, I was talking about transforming our own heritage practices before. So uh, we are trying to stay self-critical and open-minded and see where we need to develop and change our own practice. Um, we have working methods of meetings and producing policy documents, um, providing inputs to other UN documents, um, scientific events, um, just, just like the one that we're to having today. Um, ICOMOS um, does a lot of this kind of um, speaking. Um, we're very happy to spread the word also in Colombia through Ingrid and Maria. Uh, a lot of publicity material using social media with our hashtags, um, a lot of scientific events, as I said, this is just um, a very um, uh, highlights uh, list uh, for you, uh, which I, I shouldn't go into the detail of, and information leaflets, uh, meetings, etc. We have a Google Arts and Culture uh, project coming up. That will be very interesting, the one at the very end I mentioned. Google now has a story on ECOMOS and SDGs, that'll be great. Um, then we have certain priority actions that uh, we're trying to advance. One of them is the SDGs policy guidance. So this would be a very concise policy document showing the connections to different policy people between heritage and goal one, hunger, goal two, um, sorry, goal one, poverty, goal two, hunger, goal three, um, well-being, health, goal four, education, gender, all through the goals, uh, what are the connections and how they can take this to build on better policies for development. Um, this is based on ECOMOS scientific doctrine. So now we are gathering the information, compiling and um, working on the drafts. Uh, hopefully this will be launched at the beginning of the, um, next year. Uh, we are closely engaging with the UN meeting for SDGs, the high level political forum. Uh, we've been attending through different delegations, um, but sometimes na national government delegations, sometimes um, NGO um, major group um, passes um, to the last three um, forums um, so far. This, this year it was a virtual one. We had a side event um, virtually as well. Uh, some declarations and inputs to documents and some campaigns, um, especially um, the Culture 2030 Goal campaign, which um, I will mention later again. Uh, we, uh, through this campaign with, that ECOMOS is a member of, we have produced a report actually um, sorry, analyzing how over the last five years, culture has figured in these national SDG reports. Um, and uh, there were some very interesting results. We see that there are a lot of gaps. Um, culture as a concept and related keywords is mentioned about three or four times less than social, environmental, and economic terms. So seeing the actual statistics, the, the, the texts, how um, the keywords are used uh, was very in indicative. Um, so we're trying to actually gather evidence and with culture, um, sometimes it's difficult to gather evidence for development uh, actors who look at statistics and hard figures, whereas culture is often a qualitative value. It's not easy to quantify. It's not easy to explain in a mathematical way the importance. Sometimes we use stories, you know, very compelling, in-depth, um, powerful stories to make a point. But uh, we still have a lot of work about um, to do about data collection and things that uh, developers and economics people can use. Perhaps the university at uh, Bogota uh, can uh, develop some work streams on that um, quantifying culture uh, with the different facts you have there. 
Um, we have a priority action uh, for localizing our, um, in our own committees and national um, governments through our national committees. Some good examples are from our Ireland committee and India committee, uh, the underwater heritage and risk preparedness, for example. Uh, but then we realized through the annual reports that so many committees have SDG related work and they don't label it as such. So we actually do a lot of work for sustainability ourselves, but we we don't recognize it as such. So uh, that has been a very interesting discovery, um, how different interpretations of our work exist. And we're trying to make it um, more consistently and um, uh, thoroughly recognized. Um, one priority action about world heritage, uh, UNESCO has a very important um, policy document from tw um, 2015, the UNESCO World Heritage and Sustainable Development Policy. Uh, now there are workshops to see how to implement this policy. Uh, we follow the annual World Heritage Committee sessions where decisions on the list are taken, um, provide um, information or updates with events or um, uh, publicity um, material distribution. and. Um, one could say that um, something we've observed and are exploring ways to address is this interesting dilemma about how sustainable development is actually um, mentioned in world heritage circles by committee members, by national governments. And it is quite problematic, to be honest. Sometimes, um, you know, coal mines or uh, very large and intrusive infrastructure developments are justified in the name of sustainable development and, and they completely damage uh, the outstanding universal value of world heritage sites. So how to reconcile these? Um, you know, this, this is um, a dilemma that comes up in the world heritage sphere, um, particularly, we see. Um, Another priority action point is about urban partnerships and um, actually again congratulations to um, the University um, uh, de Rosario for having a September urban um, events at a calendar I, I believe and I'd like to actually remind everybody maybe you know already UN Habitat has an urban October going on now. Um, they have um, a, a campaign for 40 days for safer cities, uh, which has some arts and culture um, actions that they want to um, collect from, from um, different institutions. So lots of advocacy going around the urban goal and UN Habitat. Um, UN Habitat is a very good partner for ECOMOS. We are building relations through different um, platforms. Also UCLG, the United Cities and local governments, they are a very close partner. We collaborate on the Culture 2030 goal, for example. Um, during COVID-19, uh, we've especially had a chance to collaborate a lot, um, over webinars and new working groups. Um, Another two um, are about metrics and fundraising. Um, uh, the, these have been um, uh, more challenging and actually um, the um, responsibility lies more um, on UNESCO. They've just uh, um, issued a new um, report, the Culture 2030 Thematic Indicators Report, just last year. Uh, ECOMOS was also supporting the workshops um, where it was developed, and now the, the, the phase for implementation, training people how to use these culture indicators to measure progress for development is going on. Uh, we also um, did some analyses of ECOMOS's own work um, to see how the UN indicator 11.4.1 um, for expenditure on heritage can be applied to ourselves. And um, one thing that um, uh, was highlighted is that um, in institutions like ECOMOS um, and perhaps many other heritage professionals among us, our work is sometimes heavily voluntary. And this is um, not necessarily monetized um, to go into the reports of expenditure. But in ECOMOS, we try to do a projection. And if we were actually paid for all the voluntary work we do, the budget of the ECOMOS committees would go up to um, another two and a half times. You know, so um, there are different ways to measure um, input and effort. Um, and actually that is just the input side. What about the output side? How do we see protection? Is it more protected areas? Is it more employment? There are different ways to measure this. And that's what the UNESCO 2030 indicators are about. Um, so 
these activities have been going on um, over the last uh, several couple of years, um, three, four, five years in ECOMOS um, very intensively. And this year um, has been a special year, of course, due to COVID-19. Um, and we've at ECOMOS have been um, working to adapt fast um, and go much more digital as everybody else. Uh, we've been using social media for the International um, Day of Monuments and Sites, giving um, messages, especially relevant for COVID times, like heritage in terms of open public spaces, historic parks um, provide a resource for comfort, exercise, de-stressing. We are also talking about how tourism is transforming, how due to the difficulty of traveling very far, local tourism and rural tourism, these are gaining importance. Messages such as these uh, we're um, emphasizing these days. Um, back to the Culture 2030 goal, uh, we produced a Culture COVID-19 statement um, and you can uh, download this in several languages, um, talking about how culture is a force for building back better after the COVID-19 recovery. Uh, and this um, statement can be endorsed by individuals and institutions. So I'm inviting everybody here, please uh, go online to this um, website and endorse our statement to make it stronger. Um, the statement has actually been endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly President. That was a big um, achievement for us uh, for recognition um, but uh, the more um, local level institutions the better uh, we would like to um, contribute to this campaign growing there is still a large campaign and that needs to grow um, here we uh, I'd like to give uh, you um, a viewing of the um, 12 minute video um, that of the virtual side event that we did th this year at the UN meeting. Um, it has messages from a wide variety of stakeholders. So um, if you don't mind, I will now pause the PowerPoint and go to the YouTube video of this event. Let's see. Can you see? Yes. All right. Let's start. This event is organized by the global campaign Culture 2030 Goal in the frame of the United Nations High Level Political Forum 2020. We are a group of global and international cultural networks. If we truly want the UN 2030 agenda to be people centered, then we need culture to be recognized as a pillar of sustainable development. We know, you know, everybody knows that cultural initiatives and practices are drivers of freedoms and rights, and they bring meaning and motivation and provide coherence to the implementation and localization of the agenda. As Americans for the Arts said in 2017, we think that our arts are fundamental to our humanity. They ennoble and inspire us, fostering creativity, goodness, and beauty. The arts brings us joy, helps us express our values, and build bridges between cultures. The arts are also a fundamental component of a healthy community, as many of you have said, strengthening them socially, educationally, and economically benefits that exist even in difficult social and economic times. We know that culture is a way of diversifying the way we connect to people and also preserving um, various persons' lives, traditions, and cultural heritage. We found that the arts can support social determinants of health, including promotion, promoting social cohesion and reducing social inequalities. They can help in child development, such as mother-infant bonding, speech and language developments, and educational attainments. They can support in caregiving in terms of how we understand and conceptualize health, but also in terms of the clinical skills and well-being of staff. They can help to prevent ill health by promoting well-being, positive mental health, helping to reduce negative effects of trauma or cognitive decline or frailty. And the arts are even linked in with longevity. The more culture is taken into account, the more real the plus of the each citizen will be in the construction of the inclusive and peaceful society, giving room to 
culture means allowing all population to feel taken into account, to feel confident in the effort to build an exemplary, peaceful society in which all life is harmony, and therefore with the sole ambition of contributing to development. I wanted to talk a little bit, as Geordie said, about the Culture COVID-19 statement. Why another statement? Among the members of the coalition, we certainly had this discussion, given the excellent work already done at the global level by UNESCO and also at the regional and national levels. However, we saw the need to make the connection clearly and openly between culture, COVID-19 and the UN 2030 agenda. The same logic of interlinkages and synergies that applies across the SDGs applies also, and indeed acutely so, the response to COVID-19. In welcoming the decision to focus this year's high-level political forum on COVID-19, we wanted it to be clear that now, more than ever, culture, cultural actors and cultural concerns need to be at the centre, not the periphery of policy making. As many countries experience confinement, the vital necessity of culture for social cohesion, education and well-being was particularly brought to light, and that's something that everybody is recognising. Culture brings inspiration, comfort and hope into people's lives and promotes well-being and resilience. This is particularly important during the challenging times such as this, as this pandemic. The story of the people matters. The doctors, nurses, frontline workers, survivors, family members and communities and everyone's voices must be included. When people live through trauma, it is important that they have the opportunity to talk about their experiences, to be heard and to heal. The past few months have demonstrated that we, as culture and creative operators, are something that we already knew. We are resourceful, we are recently resilient and inventive even in these very hard times. During the emergency, uh, culture has proven to be a very powerful tool in terms of to promote the well-being and the resilience of our community. The role of the culture in this pandemic has been key. At first, cultural helped us to cope the uncertainly confinement to go through the crisis. Cultural has also served to express what is happening, as well as to give meaning to all this experience. It has been a tool to articulate communities despite the physical distance. And now, in some territories that have begun existing of the, of the lockdown, it can become an engine to reactive the economy from a new paradigm. We still have to have uh, promoting hope. We still have to promote uh, thinking of possibility for planning for a future. We can contribute to rethink and to help to imagine this future. We see that politicians are at, the, at the, the end of their imagination, so to speak. And we have a big responsibility. I'll be presenting the report on behalf of our campaign, um, the drafting of which ECOMOS was tasked with, along with contributions from our partners. It was launched um, last September on the occasion of the SDG Summit and submitted to the HLPF 2020 as well as an input um, on the inputs platform. Going back very quickly to the background of the report, how it um, was initiated, uh, we have the driving question in our campaign, how can culture contribute as a fourth pillar of sustainable development? We are convinced that processes related to culture, that is heritage, creativity and diversity, are at the core of life and must be at the core of sustainable development. We are convinced that sustainable development will only be achieved if its cultural dimension is explicitly acknowledged in international and national agendas and becomes fully operational in short-term, mid-term and long-term policies and programs. If we truly want the UN 2030 agenda to be people-centered, then we need culture to be recognized as a pillar of sustainable development. This call to action will 
galvanize the multilateral effort to fulfill potential of culture as we build better and create the future we want. This is especially important in this moment as the interlinkage between culture and the 2030 agenda for sustainable development are becoming more evidence to experts and policy makers. I think that having uh, Art and, art and culture is, um, are critical elements of an equitable framework. They reflect the power of communities, as we have highlighted. They, they, if, you, if you are able to harness the soft power of the community, then we're able to influence structural oppression and change and accomplish these sustainable development goals. Well, the arguments we've made for the arts across our reports from the World Health Organization is that they can provide solutions to challenges where we currently don't have solutions. They're also often very cost effective because they tackle multiple different aspects of health and social determinants of health. And they also help us to achieve many different priorities already agreed globally. Finally, the arts are important because we've got challenges on resources, particularly in the wake of COVID. We need every sector to step up and play a role in the recovery from this. And the arts and cultural sector is incredibly well placed to do so. I believe that it's necessary to put our energy into warranting these rights from all people, especially for the most vulnerable, so that we can create more solidarity cities, cities of resilience that are capable or imagining and innovating ways to overcome this crisis and inhabit as a community, a post-pandemic world that is sustainable for natural and humanity, in which all the sustainable development goals become a reality. Let's continue this effort. Culture is very important in our, in our life. It plays an important role. And uh, it is whatever we do and towards the achievement of the goal that we set ourselves, culture is a, it's at the center of it. First of all, we need governments at all levels to see culture and cultural institutions as both a source of vital information and insights to inform policy as well as a partner in, develop, in delivering um, its policy decisions. Secondly, we need to include cultural issues in our calculations and indicator basis as UNESCO is already doing Thirdly, we need strong signals from the highest levels, such as from the President of the United Nations General Assembly, in order to show the way. And finally, of course, we need to work within our own fields to build understanding of the potential libraries have to support development and help realize this. In this, we would uh, recommend that all stakeholders consider culture from the outset in national development planning, have wider consultation mechanisms, including cultural actors, have a coherent global community around culture, have a UN high-level meeting on culture, and have better dissemination of existing evidence and collection of new data. Uh, improvements, um, promote local SDG implementation uh, in context of local cultural actors, and also looking at ourselves to be self-critical, we should strengthen our own efforts as the cultural sector in mainstreaming into the SDGs. I feel that the, the, the statement and the report will be the key accelerator uh, or share their thoughts to advocate for culture in the 2030 agenda. What you are doing building on, on policy advices uh, about knowledge building, cooperation and advocacy effort, I'm convinced that we can prompt uh, the contribution of culture to building a more sustainable future. It is my pleasure to endorse the Culture 2030 Goal Statement entitled Ensuring Culture Fulfill Its Potential in Responding to the COVID Pandemic. I call on government, UN agencies, and all stakeholders to endorse the Culture 2030 Goal Statement and reflect upon and act in pursuit of its guiding principles.
Right, so <clears throat> we watched the video. Thank you for your patience. Uh, even 12 minutes can seem a bit long, but uh, this is indeed a imp 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 oh, Sorry, there is um, some... Is that from me? Sorry about that. <laughs> the YouTube went on to autoplay, excuse me. Uh, so uh, this is a big uh, activity stream for us. And uh, that's why I was encouraging everybody to have a look and endorse the statements for us. Um, I'll go back to the presentation now, um, the PowerPoint, just a sec. Right, so here we are. Uh, so moving on, um, uh, we already touched on um, how UN Habitat is dealing with um, the COVID times and uh, these uh, Urban October events, um, I'd like to uh, highlight um, again for your attention. Uh, there is one interesting e-commerce event on October 13th um, on climate resilience and culture, um, also with the participation of UNESCO and UCLG and ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. So that will be an interesting one. Um, please look out for that. Um, and so looking at uh, the general picture, um, have we progressed um, in all this advocacy work? What have we done? In the, on the e-commerce side, we've been very busy, a lot of activities. There is um, increasing awareness, let's say, in these topics, uh, but we still need more. So we'll need to continue our work. Um, on the major um, international policy arenas, um, e-commerce has um, gained uh, more visibility steadily. Um, here, there's a picture of, uh, I think it was Maria Espinosa. She was the previous um, President of the United Nations, Nations General Assembly from Ecuador. From, so she was very interested in, in um, our cultural heritage uh, message as Quito is, you know, the first uh, world heritage town in the world to be inscribed. It's a number one is Galapagos, number two is Quito, as far as I know. So bravo to Ecuador with that. Um, so uh, localizing efforts continue. We uh, need to do better with that. Um, and it's a matter of, um, communication, um, something we keep em emphasizing, understanding um, different stakeholders, different perspectives, um, being open-minded and explaining the case for heritage, um, how to um, make sure that it's considered in upstream decision-making because that's how a lot of loss to heritage happens. Uh, there are systemic divides between theory and practice, high-level, low-level grassroots, uh, heritage, non-heritage. So there are lots of linkage linkages to be made, lots of connections. Um, and for every one of us, um, this is a reminder and a call. Uh, you can be an SDGs ambassador. Please feel, um, consider yourself an SDGs ambassador, especially after this, lecture, this presentation today. <laughs> um, and also you are a heritage ambassador in sustainability circles in this, in, uh, reciprocally. Um, and I was already mentioning how to make our work for, um, go from implicit to explicit, to discover um, the connections and to harness them, to maximize them. And and I think for everybody who is doing um, a heritage related um, project, especially, uh, we should be asking ourselves, how are we engaging uh, with these topics of sustainability, with, with the society, economy, environment, peace, and all these topics uh, that are on the table. Um, and um, from here, um, I will try to give you some examples as the last part of, of the presentation on um, uh, what um, I've been experiencing um, at the local level with some um, various projects over the years that I was involved in. And looking back, uh, one sees which SDGs have been um, uh, most, um, most, most closely um, dealt with, for example. Uh, this is a very interesting one I'd like to share. I think um, it was between um, Turkish and Greek um, experts of architectural um, history and architecture and conservation uh, to uh, study the um, heritage left behind after the population exchange. And this was an EU program. We won the Europa Nostra Prize, one of the awards that year um, in 20, 2006, I believe. Uh, lots of visits, workshops, um, talking with uh, local communities on how they perceive the heritage of the other. Um, and uh, I think this SDG 16 about peace and justice and institutions, um, this is especially um, uh, still valid in so many areas of the world, you know, where conflict is continuing or the um, aftermath of conflict um, is still being dealt with. Um, so heritage is a driver for peace. Um, so this is uh, my doctoral dissertation um, where 
actually looking at um, governance aspects of urban conservation, how actors come together. That is a key sustainability topic. Um, it's one, one of the reasons why I, I was in, very happy to, and um, enthusiastic to work on the SDGs. Uh, so looking at different um, levels of uh, municipalities, uh, metropolitan, mid-level tourist city to a very uh, declined uh, small rural town, uh, Mudurno, where I still work actually. Um, and uh, that my actual um, hypothesis that um, was I was trying to um, kind of prove, let's say, was uh, you need different ingredients to make a successful cake. You know, like this means you have to have the money, you have to make have the decision makers, you have to have community and the users um, of the buildings, the owners of the buildings. You have to have the experts, the scientific knowledge, and you have to have a good coordination and leadership among them. So this is a real societal collaboration effort preserving heritage, um, having beautifully kept uh, livable towns. This is um, an all society team effort. Um, so the, a lot of promising examples uh, could be found in Turkey um, after a lot of mistakes have been made also um, over the years, but with experience, you know, mistakes are solved and better practices um, also with peer to peer learning among gover um, local governments. Um, Coming to one of the uh, larger uh, metropolitan um, go local governments in Turkey, um, in Istanbul, we, uh, there, I was involved in a site management uh, planning project in the district of Eyüp. So this is just north of the historical peninsula where everybody go goes to visit the Hagia Sophia and all the tourist sites. Uh, this is a very important Islamic pilgrimage uh, site um, as well as a very old um, Ottoman neighborhood. And uh, during our site management, planning we had um, issues reconciling transport projects and uh, access to the waterfront of the local citizens how to manage local life with um, visiting pilgrims and tourists um, and also how to uh, make visible the different layers of history different values uh, sometimes a, a place is branded with only a couple of images or things they are known for whereas there are so many different levels um, of values to be discovered and enjoyed and um, so this is a, a matter of um, a coordinating site management planning work um, and then um, go, moving on to um, the, a very much smaller context uh, where I'm still working um, in Mudurnu. Um, this is a very small Silk Road town between Istanbul and Ankara in Turkey. Um, I did the site management plan there. Um, I was the author of that with a the team. Then um, I became a consultant to the municipality to implement projects. So you see some highlights of these uh, uh, projects that were part of implementing the site management plan. I am a big believer in site management planning. And this is still uh, relatively new in Turkey, spatial planning, um, the, the classical territorial development planning um, is still much stronger than strategic um, public participatory strategic planning. So um, it's been a challenge, but it's been very worthwhile. Um, here, especially, uh, we have perhaps a big sustainability um, issue is how a lot of money is put into um, very unfeasible, unsustainable projects. Um, and a lot of money is lacking where uh, you would have much more socially sustainable investments. This is um, the case in Moderna still, where we're advocating for this. Uh, I'm talking about uh, this particular problem in Moderna because if you Google Moderna these days, what comes up is uh, a ghost town of chateaus, crazy, absurd, ridiculous chateaus. Um, Burj El Babas is the name of this project, which was bankrupt. You have a ghost town of 700 villas. Nobody's living in them. You see a picture um, of, of this at the bottom left corner there. This is just outside the, the town center. And um, I just published a paper comparing the Chita Slow, Slow City, UNESCO World Heritage, Cultural Heritage Management Planning work we've done with this interesting project, which has made the headlines everywhere from BBC, CNN, New York Times, how in terms of SDGs and sustainable development, there is a world of difference. We still haven't lost Moderna. I'm actually now part of an NGO there. I'm at the board of the NGO, working really at the civil society level rather than an expert or an administrator now. I find that that is where I might make more of a difference. And I actually bought um, a share of a historic building there and I'm turning it personally with my friends into a cultural center and a boutique hotel. So maybe one day you come and visit us in this very small town of Moderna. Um, 
And I think that's it for me. Um, here's um, my contact details, my personal consultancy plus the e-commerce work. Um, please follow us on Twitter. And uh, thank you for your attention. Um, that's, um, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ege. I have, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from Miloud. Uh, from Algeria, Iran. What are the effects of tourism on tangible cultural, cultural heritage? And is there a possibility to evaluate the criteria selection of tangible cultural heritage in the future? Uh, so what is the effect on tangible and intangible and the criteria for assessment? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Uh, that's an important point. Uh, well, you know, Tourism has both positive and negative effects. Uh, it depends on how well designed and how um, community led perhaps the project is or um, how much it's based on um, a solid uh, uh, principles. Um, there was a, an expert from UNESCO once who said tourism is like fire. It can um, burn your, it, it can cook your food in your kitchen and it can burn down your house. So. It depends on the dosage and the type of tourism. So there's been a lot of um, discussion of how mass tourism is damaging. Um, and after COVID, it's, it'll be very interesting to see the, the um, let's say the collapse of perhaps of, of a lot of that mass tourism industry and individual tourism is now um, um, more feasible. Um, there's a lot of resources out there about how to make tourism sustainable. So the UNWTO, World Tourism Organization, is working on that. And tourism is a big employment sector, so uh, it, it is a key um, way for culture, heritage to um, contribute to sustainable development. Uh, in terms of tangible heritage, you know, the, the use is key, how you use um, buildings, how you modernize them for comfort of visitors. Um, and I, I would say um, regulation and experience with better design solutions, you know, creative solutions, win-win solutions, where you keep good value in heritage sites without having to compromise um, comfortable use. This is possible. It just requires patience and um, care. It's, it's uh, and not shortcuts, but, you know, these things take a lot of care, you know. Um, and in terms of criteria, um, I was talking about resources. ECOMOS has the Cultural Tourism Charter um, and the UNWTO has the Tourism for SDGs portal. Um, very nice resource. Um, so I think you can find a lot of um, good, good information out there. With, with COVID, of course, we're looking at new literature and it's important to share experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this question was from where again? From Algeria or? From Algeria, from, yes. Uh, if you wish all the participants, you, you can activate your, um, your audio and also participate in, in the question and answer section or just uh, raise your hands or try, uh, we, can, we can enable now the microphones. Yes, this question was coming from Iran. Sorry, Ingrid, my, um, apologies. Um, I forgot to add one point, if I may. Oh, yeah. um, Continue, okay. yes. Because, um, yes. I, I, because uh, yeah, yeah um, I, I didn't mention anything about intangible heritage, and that's actually yeah. maybe even more important in the tourism business, um, because um, a lot of degeneration of uh, traditional practices, you know, festivals uh, for tourists' uh, pleasure happens. That's the big risk. Um, and also an alienation and loss of identity. I mean, you see these in uh, very famous places like Venice and Dubrovnik, um, how um, the real social fabric of those is the real people are being distanced from it, but also in terms of uh, losing the essence, the spirit, and also the dignity of how those practices really are or were. Um, and here, respect for the local, predominant um, concerns prioritizing the needs of the local, the tourist being a guest who needs to be respectful um, and who needs to adapt to the local um, customs and um, needs. You know, these principles um, will also safeguard um, intangible cultural heritage. Thank you for that. Okay, so on to the next question. Thank you. Um, 
I also wanted to know that you mentioned we were talking about the, the subject of tourism. I have a question and it's that during this situation of, uh, of the COVID-19, was there both, because we really noticed there was a worldwide phenomena of noticing this lacking of, of not being able to go to heritage sites, to museums, Hello? cultural institutes. Uh, uh, yes, Milud, we'll give you one second and we'll, uh, you can open up the microphone. Do you speak Arabic? Uh, not, not really. Um, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask you about uh, a number of uh, selection criteria of Tanj, uh, material uh, cultural heritage. Is there a possibility to uh, augment uh, this number? Selection criteria for heritage, um, to do what? Select for what? Of UNESCO. Tangible yeah. cultural heritage. Oh, you, the UNESCO cultural heritage sites. Yeah. Selection criteria. You're asking if the, it's... There are, there are uh, uh, 10, 10, uh, uh, 10 uh, outstanding values. Yes, 10 criteria. Yes, um, 10 criteria. Uh, is there, uh, are there possibility to, to augment uh, uh, this number in the future? It's not easy, but it's possible, I would say. Um, you know, the UNESCO World Heritage Convention is going to celebrate 50 years in 2022. And uh, there is a lot of debate on um, the next 50 years and a reform to the process. People need, feel that the, the process uh, will probably have to be reformed um, to update itself to new challenges and maybe more criteria about Sustainable use, for example, might be added. Um, who I cannot, um, say, you know, project um, for for certainty in any way. Um, these criteria have been developed over the years. Uh, it would take the committee decisions and working groups on the operational guidelines and a lot of political negotiation. So very long process, um, but it's happened before, and um, you know why not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran, shukran. Afwan. Do we have other questions? Would you like to open your microphones? You're now, uh, you're all able to enable your microphones or to send through our chat. There was a question from Iran, I think. You were starting to ask a question from... It was that one. That, yeah, from Iran, from uh, Mulad, yeah. The same one. He's from Iran, from Algeria. Okay. Uh, Fernando, do you want to ask a question? Your mic is open. Yeah. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you for, for your view regarding restoration and preservation of cultural heritage sites. Uh, um, if they should be more like uh, supported from, from government taxes or they should be self uh, financed. financed and to be more, I mean, I would like to know more your view on that side because I, I think um, the experience that you share on, on, on the sites in Turkey was very interesting. See how if they can be health sustainable economically or should uh, public resources should be just um, injected into the policy of preservation and restoration of site? Yeah. Um, you know, I suppose my answers in summary would be diversify all of them. Um, traditionally, it was the state who subsidized um, and many times the state owns these places. Um, and then traditionally, um, private owners um, are um, forced to pro um, preserve their, um, restore and conserve their buildings um, because of the laws, they are forced to do it without any financial aid. Now that has changed, thankfully. Um, now, um, more, you know, more and more countries are um, providing incentives and uh, aid and support. Um, 
sometimes um, it's uh, low income interest credits, sometimes it's grants, but um, because cultural heritage is a public good, you know, it's when a person owns a building, it's not just for them themselves that to benefit, it's for society to benefit. That, that's why the state has to be, the public cannot go away. But the problem is, um, I mean, the reason why the state should not be alone, um, you know, the development of public-private pri par um, public partnerships um, or incentives to private businesses to finance is because there is so much more resources in the private. I mean, uh, many states mm -hmm. don't have enough. I mean, there, there's just too much uh, to preserve. Mm -hmm. in, in Turkey, it's for sure. We have, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of um, registered buildings and the Ministry of Culture has the smallest budget. I mean, their budget compared to f defense, you know, military, for example, or, or, or law enforcement, uh, you know, many other ministries is tiny. So um, you can't really expect the state in terms of the culture ministry to, to take care of all of the financing. They can be um, regulating and also facilitating, you know, um, so incentives and, and tax incentives especially are important. But then harnessing um, like the natural forces of the um, real estate economy. Uh, you know, there are mechanisms uh, for investment um, that is later reimbursed by taxes, for example, or, or um, making it easy for uh, investors to do uh, heritage conservation in their projects and getting some benefit from the state in return. And also making sure that um, businesses um, that are based on cultural heritage um, have better credits and um, also um, they are encouraged by, by, the, um, by the society, by the demand, you know, there's more demand for good heritage cultural tourism places. So um, it's not just the state alone. Um, there are different ways of financing. Um, and sponsors and also sometimes um, renting or um, giving over uh, the, for use uh, to private businesses um, to actually make money off of them. There are so many profitable museums or cultural centers, there's franchises. There are ways to make money off of culture and tourism. People are willing to pay for many things, experiences, beauty, especially um, now that after COVID, I think people are re-questioning the meaning of life. You know, and there are new forms of tourism. Um, there are more that heritage, especially rural landscapes can offer people. Um, and I think already Maria in the Colombia landscape mentioned, you know, the horse rides around the rivers. Um, so lots of different ways uh, we must uh, diversify. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Regarding what Maria mentioned in her brief introduction also is that uh, she was saying that they're reassessing how, uh, how actually tourism should be so it's more sustainable for the site. And my question that I was regarding earlier is how has this time of the pandemic made you also, as it has it been at some point positive to see the, um, to, to discuss about what's happening when we don't have access to cultural sites, to museums, and is that lack and, and also the, the effects that it has had in the economy, has it at some point been positive for your, um, for your, like, uh, for the 2030 agenda? For sustainable development and just actually making it visible like what happens when you don't have access to these sites to museums to libraries to heritage sites yeah that's actually um a big um issue um thank you for pointing it out ingrid um as far as our colleagues um mention report um there are um risks that were already existing which have been heightened um, now there are more dangers when a lot of sites um, are um, off limits so uh, in contexts where um, like the rule of law in um, in uh, countries um, around the world uh, the democratic um, and legal processes you know of um, when they are somehow weaker um, you know environmental crimes or cultural heritage crimes 
they they don't stop. They, I mean, we cannot go and we cannot safeguard these places, but uh, the criminals do. You know, so we 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 have seen some some um, uh, some worse cases in Turkey, for example. Um, on the other hand, um, because there is uh, less pressure from use, a lot of places are uh, relieved, and you see this in the uh, nature context more. You know, when there's less use, people are talking about how Venice has now the canals cl clear, fish are swimming again. In India, you can actually see the Himalayas, no, no air pollution anymore. So um, I think it's difficult to assess the overall results. There are both factors involved, but um, there, again, plus and minus, um, another thing about the mentality of decision makers and what's being discussed is uh, because of this pause um, and this opportunity to reassess um, and how good it is to slow down and how, how it might be when capitalism is somehow um, less, less aggressive, um, the possibilities are exciting to people. Um, so maybe there's a window of opportunity to really make policy changes. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we also hear that when the pandemic is somehow uh, over and there's a new normal and the economies are fully open, there will be this rush to catch up and there will be even faster infrastructure developments and more aggressive economic packages and they will not include cultural heritage enough. Um, so we, we will need to fight um, harder even. Um, so that in that accelerated catch up um, times, we will not have more losses. Um, other than that, um, with the pandemic, um, oh, well, we were also saying that cultural heritage is valuable and vulnerable. And this has been exacerbating, uh, exacerbated in both um, ways. Uh, we talked about how the vulnerabilities are exas exacerbated, but the value um, people, how would we get through the pandemic without arts and culture entertainment? I mean, people are actually um, noticing um, that value. Um, and we're trying to move with that, build on that case, you know, and a lot of the UN Habitat's messaging has been around um, how both um, it has been a source of comfort and, and psychological relief, um, but also, um, you know, the experiences. And this is also with climate heritage. I mean, cultural heritage embodies centuries of experiments and some of them are still useful for climate adaptation, climate mitigation. And the same with pandemic responses. I mean, you know, there, there's a very funny and silly example I like to give in, from Turkey, which is um, the Odo Colonia, you know, th this co Colonia, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, if you've been to Turkey, Colonia is like the ubiquitous traditional hospitality item. It's alcoholic, 80% alcohol, very good disinfectant. And um, there's a culture in Turkey of giving kolonia to people who've just come home, been traveling. And I think this has actually helped with a lot of the hygiene. This is a very um, basic intangible cultural heritage practice, you know? Um, or uh, the way that traditional societies have ways of taking care of the elderly, you know, elderly homes in more industrialized countries were hit worse. So um, there are ways of doing things traditionally that are still better than modernized societies when it comes to a crisis like this, you know, so uh, lots of opportunities, I would say. Does that answer the question? Thank you very much. That was very illustrating. And, and very interesting how the intangible heritage practice actually proved very effective during these times. Actually, another thing that we've noticed is in the general, also in the fields of other, other areas and institutions, cultural institutions of heritage, like archives, libraries, also museums, was to recover sources of information of how um, even in the early century with the Spanish flu, there was also the, the how they were, how they um, were able to be resilient and etc. with all this during this time and how it was, it's not the first time as well that we're living through this. We have another question um, from Patrick. Um, Patrick, in regards to the challenges of implementation, do you think there is a need for new approaches or are there emerging processes in the heritage profession that you feel deserve greater investigation? And um, if you wish, uh, Patrick, you can open your mic and, and oh. video also. Welcome. 
Hi. Hi, Ingrid. Hi. So nice to see you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so um, should I answer or do you want to add to the question, Patrick? No, no, that's, that's uh, if you could answer, that'd be great. Um, okay, well, yes, sure, there are new avenues, absolutely. Um, I, will, I can just give you some, um, uh, some examples. Um, I, I might not be able to provide an exhaustive list, but um, if you're interested in the subject, um, there is a very active uh, UNESCO chair on heritage futures. Um, based in uh, Linnaeus University in Sweden. Um, Cornelius is a colleague um, and you can find it very easily. I, I can help if you like. Oh, they have a, sorry? Voltor? Yes, you know Cornelius. Okay. I've read some of his papers, yes. Yeah, and um, in terms of which um, themes are um, emerging as newly relevant, well, digitalization, you know, um, our digital technology, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, in, in terms of um, how you can experience uh, documents, documentation is key, um, especially in terms of disaster management. Some, sometimes documentation is the only way um, and the technologies are now amazing, you know, very fast advancing also with conservation of, um, so digital technologies um, are one thing. And then decolonization, you know, um, I mean, the whole world is being shaken up um, by Black Lives Matter, for example. Um, and th this has a heritage component. So what do we do with those monuments? You know, how do we reinterpret? This is also with uh, Africa, a lot of African countries are dealing with colonial heritage and how to, you know, how to make it an agent of change, positive change without, ha like, without forgetting, but learning, you know, there's a lot of um, um, revisiting, reinterpretation uh, being done and maybe use. Um, that's one, decolonization. And then um, let's see what else I can uh, talk about. Um, well, the aspects of sustainability are still new, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. for many, many heritage practitioners still, um, like g getting out of our traditional specializations and talking about, you know, um, the, the poverty level of our neighborhood, for example. You know, so, some people um, are still working in, in, in a very, um, ir like, removed way from, from these things. And... Um, also, um, in terms of reconciling with development, um, I mean, I'm not meaning to say that we should compromise heritage, but um, engaging in dialogue and um, I suppose um, being part of um, conversations that we haven't been part of before, you know, being at the table of the climate change um, policies, that's, that's new. Um, and um, also in terms of, um, health policies, like uh, the report by the World Health Organization, Arts and Health, that is brand new. They have just started to gather topics. So um, I think sustainability in itself um, is, 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 um, has a lot of um, novelty in it for us. Um, but I, I would say digital and youth also, intergenerational dialogue, um, having uh, more voice for, for young people um, in, in heritage. Um, I think uh, what happens with Fridays for Future, you know, the way that the youth are leading the way for um, heritage, um, sorry, for climate action is, um, is a model perhaps we should follow for heritage. And Africa is actually the future in a way. I mean, um, the African continent in terms of the young population and how the youth are activ activated there. They're very organized around climate, for example, um, and also for new sources of resilience, you know, like the gene blind banks and also food security is a big issue. I mean, after the pandemic, we see how um, growing your own food, what a big advantage it must, it, it is actually, you know, um, and also local food, um, and the connections between wildlife by biodiversity conservation and how the encroachment into these um, wild animals habitats is ha I mean that, that's one of the factors of, of these um, pandemics um, as far as we understand and um, here um, traditional intangible knowledge you know how to safeguard these resources and working with indigenous peoples so human rights um, I mean, I can go on about these big, big, big topics. These are all our SDGs things, but they're all in the future, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Because I'm just writing my thesis. So <laughs> I'm okay. looking 
people-centered approaches. So your question answers were great. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to your thesis. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. Me too. Regarding also what you just mentioned about the food and uh, and all this relationship with heritage, I just came into mind uh, an example that I heard in the news a couple of days ago in Colombia, also near the coffee cultural landscape of a cultural site and a, a, a site called Panaca, which is more a tourism site where people go and visit and, and it had been off, of course, during the lockdown, completely locked, uh, closed. They used the, the region, the land to uh, produce food for all of the workers that um, that were working on the site that are so so it's uh, interesting how they these heritage or cultural sites or tourism sites also have more functions and, and are becoming it's an it's a clear example of what you just kind of mentioned and uh, yeah I think uh, we, we have also one question from Mula, uh, Milud uh, what are important references of this subject I don't know if you I'm sorry, could you repeat? What are important references of this subject? Milud uh, is asking us from Algeria. Um, of the subject um, in general or of food security? or um, No, I think in general. In general. Um, well, please um, look at the UN Sustainable Development uh, webpage. Um, I gave, I can share the PowerPoint presentation or if you took a screenshot or let me, let me write for you in the chat box now the, um, that link for you. Um, that has a lot of resources. Um, and there are very good Twitter accounts. Um, you can use social media to reach um, because there is a very, you know, white and decentralized network of people working on these topics and um, at ECOMOS um, at the working group um, I'm trying to keep um, you know, gathering the important sources together um, to, and uh, it, it's actually um, a compilation work I don't know if we have a good one place one-stop shop at the moment um, but the, the UN is a good resource um, they try to um, write it in a language that's not always too technical. Um, I mean, they are bureaucracy, but uh, the, the SDGs um, resources are very user friendly. Um, also, uh, check out the ECOMOS um, website where we have listed some of the resources. I'm also putting it into the chat box for you. Um, Europa Nostra has some good ones. The British Academy just uh, issued one, the, the, the missing pillar, culture on SDGs. Um, yeah. Well, I can't think of more right now, but um, there are some, you, you'll, you'll need to do a little bit of a simple uh, investigation. So you can contact us later. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, I, I see in the chat, uh, Maria Eugenia commented on uh, food security and um, going back to farming practices. So I don't know if you want to comment something, Maria Eugenia, or? Eh, hola. No, escuchando a, a la conferencia hacia reflexiones internas de cómo eh, no sé, la lentitud o el cierre nos ha vuelto a llevar a, 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 a sembrar nuestra propia comida y no supermercados están cerrados, hay que comer de lo que, de lo que, que producimos. Un poco eso. Nosotros que somos aquí rurales, ustedes en Bogotá tienen mayor conflicto porque donde van a, no tienen la disciplina y si no se va al supermercado no se come. Es muy, muy dramático. So Manihania just mentioned that because of the closure, the lockdown, and this kind of pacing down, slowing down because of the pandemic, uh, that especially in her area, that she's in the rural area of uh, Colombia or in the area near Armenia, uh, that uh, they're going back to farming practices. It's a little bit harder here with some of the supermarkets closed and they, they actually it, it's it's been becoming like more uh, an increasing practice. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
yeah so the, the rural parts a little bit more complicated <laughs> yeah. sorry yeah, and the rural areas of the world have been disadvantaged, you know, traditionally, and now maybe the tables are turning. There is a new popularity with rural, and I don't know if it will stop the rate of urbanization, because, you know, urbanization around the world is at a crazy speed, and we will have most of the world urbanized in, by 2075, I think or 2070, um, but um, maybe those calculations need to be revisited after this. And um, there will be new models, um, there will be demographic shifts, people will like being less densely populated and um, the rural areas are already ready, it seems. Yeah, it's, it, it, that's, that's the future, I think, maybe. But as long as we don't spoil those places, because human beings, we are very dangerous creatures, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's because the tourists here, uh, we, we not not all not all the people, but uh, most of the people are very happy with no tourists. Mm -hmm. We recover the the silence, and the be quiet, and the. But the without tourists, how do you make money without the tourists now? I mean, uh, yeah. because because the tourists were, I think it was the um, was a, a boom. Ma, but the the normal life here is a rural life, not a tourist. So maybe people in those rural places they didn't make so much money in the first place. Some other people did make money out of that tourism. Yeah, yeah, but not but, but not the other the owners. Uh, are the 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 agents uh, of trips and uh, all the, the visitors the tourism or... uh, yeah but not the not the, the the farmers or or even the the local people mm -hmm. so the way That's the why... it seems the way the tourism sector was organized um, is not working right now and there will be new ways of they are suffering they are suffering because uh, there's no, there's no um, the planes, there's no buses, there's no movement, no, no transportation. So the local people uh, that can move in bicycles or even walking are, uh, this um, are, are the tourists, the, the own tourists. It's a, it's, a new, it's a new wave. I mean, like a, like a hippies. Yes, uh, ah. yes. So maybe you have new visitors who become new inhabitants who have adopted yeah. the there. The, but but the but the tourism is uh, from the old from the town. The people from the small towns go to the farms, go to the river, go to okay. work, go to see birds and and make another uh, kind of uh, tourist, like old oh. times, like fifty years ago. That may be much more sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. We hope uh, to keep, but we know even that it, it's not possible. Uh, when the airports uh, open, there's going to um, be a mass of tourists. Hmm. Yes, when they open, you see, there is this- Yeah, when they're open. Gates when that we are all need to be ready for. Um, and I heard yeah. projections of six months, for example, but maybe they didn't take into account the second wave. I mean, this fall, we will have more of the pandemic probably, right? Um, yeah. So maybe after that wave, another six months, but um, it will pass quickly and we, we must be ready for the comeback. <laughs> yeah. We hope uh, in a year, traditional, uh, the airport of Armenia has... Uh, 20 uh, flights a day, and today two, only two. One to Bogota, one to Medellin, no more. And normally, where do they fly from? From Twenty Cartagena, from Miami, from uh, uh, Europe. 20 uh, flights a day. As a, as Direct flights from Europe into your airport? Yeah, yeah, you can believe it. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing to realize that now we have only two. You're enjoying this. Yeah, you know, I live here uh, near to the airport and uh, I, I comment to my husband, this, this is silent, no flights over every minute. That's, 
that's a, a piece. That's a silence. That's a, another kind but of life. I want to ask, you know, like who benefited and who lost out of this? You know, I mean, uh, after so much loss, um, some people in society really suffered economic losses. But um, it sounds like your community wasn't among the ones who lost in the worst way. Um, and I mean, or maybe yeah, people you know, have suffered uh, the author, somehow. The author of uh, parks, uh, thematic parks, are uh, closed and they move a lot of, of tourism. Uh, they are losing. Uh, even uh, the museums and the parks of uh, rural parks like Panaca. Uh, uh, mm, oh, now uh, they are closed and they, they move a lot of uh, transportation and food and uh, many touristic uh, mm, products and uh, they are closed since uh, March. So they are losing a lot of money, but I think uh, they are, I, I don't think they are losing. They are uh, no winning. <laughs> it's another, it's another uh, concept. Uh, uh, when, you, when you are uh, prospecting to gain in, uh, the staff to move the, the, the people all over the world, they, they lose, but Really, they don't lose. It's a paradoxic thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. There are many people that, that work in that in the other parks that doesn't have a work, but they change. They they find another work. As long as they find a way to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Some some are uh, waiting, but the the wait is so long that they might look another chance and there, there are many new new creative uh, business yeah. I think actually the, the best the most creative solutions seem to come under pressure not, you know? not, not that big but uh, but a small business uh, could uh, uh, give uh, a chance to live mm -hmm. in yeah. Mudurnu my town um, uh, the, one of the ladies there um, she started to do handcrafts because of the boredom of sitting at home during the pandemic. And now I'm helping her um, market those handicrafts, for example. Yeah. Like, uh, without hurry, without hurry, she can, she can uh, make other things and maybe prepare to, to, the, to the open, to the open uh, negotiation or maybe tourists or something. Here we have a, a, a slow town in Pihau, and um, with my with my students at the university, are uh, making a, a photography um, all over to make uh, uh, rules for in, for conservating the old town, all uh, um, houses, and they are very surprised because m many of them never went to to Pihau, and Pihau has, uh, I think, uh, a, a Cita Slow, Cita Slow uh, program. See, program. So they are very happy with, with our uh, people. Great. Great. Yeah. Well, we're <laughs> approaching almost 30 hours of the event, so I'm going to invite you, everyone. I don't know if uh, uh, you, if if you can show again your email, contact email, in case, um, in case there are any further questions, you have Dr. Ege Wilderim's uh, contact information and to further reach her by email. And, um, oh, here, yes, we have it there in the chat. So thank you very, very much. Thank you everyone for your assistance, for your participations, and, uh, and especially both of you for your fabulous presentations. And uh, this is really food for thought. It gives you a lot to think about and to reflect on how we as heritage institutions are, are coping and are taking into account the SDGs and uh, into our future planning. So thank you so much. 
We had a lot of different participants from different countries and institutions and archives and uh, museums and heritage sites. So, so this was very, very wonderful. On um, behalf of the University of Rosario, I would like to give you again this, um, well, our invitation to come again when it's possible. So we're only a few blocks away, some steps away from the Gulf Museum, which we already visited. So you're all welcome to come visit in the near future. We hope that we have this. Yes, we're, we're able Thank to you. go very soon. Shall we take a, um, a screenshot family photo if everybody oh. can open their videos? If yeah. everyone can open their videos and we'll take the screenshot, yes. It's a nice please tradition now. And you please keep in touch. <laughs> we will. So we'll have it, por favor. Even, even to even to Bueno. Is everyone opening more? Lady Nicolás. Ceci, Blanca. Margarita. Anyone else before we... Ceci, Blanca, Nico. Listo. Okay. We're just going to take a quick... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Smile. Bravo. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so very much. much. And Thank you. Uh, Ingrid, oh, gracias. Okay, bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye, ciao, bye, bye. ciao, bye. ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Keep, okay. We're showing our website, Museo de la Universidad Rosario, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and YouTube, and you'll find a YouTube of this event posted um, to our website. Gracias. Gracias, gracias. Gracias, Margarita. Gracias a todos. Muy interesante todo. Gracias. Y no se pierdan, no se pierdan tanto tiempo. Margarita, que no volvió. Y Ingrid, mucho gusto en conocerla.